terms of some of the major trends that we are seeing over the course of 2021 and into the first half of this year, before I do so, I just want to essentially demonstrate how we categorize the adversaries that we see. Three major categories. So firstly, targeted nation state adversaries. These are adversaries who are typically linked to a country's military, intelligence or policing apparatus. Next, e-crime adversaries. So these are financially motivated cyber criminals. And then lastly, hacktivism. So these are organizations who will conduct uh, cybersecurity compromises in order to further a social or political aim. In terms of the threat from ransomware, the major threats come from na nation state adversaries and e-crime actors. So historically, nation state actors, for the most part, didn't engage in ransomware attacks or ransomware attacks to any high degree. We've seen a change in tactics recently over the course of 2021, where we've seen nation state adversaries conduct ransomware attacks specifically for destructive purposes. They have no intention of, they have no intention of ransoming that data in order to make a profit. They're doing it purely for destructive reasons and they're using criminal personas effectively for um, plausible deniability. So that's an interesting technique we've seen over the past year. The vast majority of ransomware attacks that we are seeing are conducted by e-crime adversaries, so financially motivated cyber criminals. In terms of the e-crime environment, a number of changes have taken place over the course of 2021. So in terms of Ransomware data leaks, we saw an 82% increase in the number of data leaks in 2021 as compared with 2020. We've also seen a diversification of that environment. So we've seen, uh, we use the term big game hunting ransomware organizations. Essentially, these are dedicated uh, ransomware gangs. They will target large organizations purely because of the perceived notion that they will be able to pay for this data or they wish to avoid reputational damage. So essentially they're targeting large organizations purely for that fact. We're also seeing an increase in uh, ransomware as a service operations. Mm. So in the past where ransomware was solely conducted by dedicated ransomware groups, we are now seeing a, a spreading of the risk. So various criminal groups will be involved in the ransomware operation. You'll have one group that will conduct initial access into a victim's network. They will sell that access on to other cyber criminals. You'll see other groups that specialize in lateral movement within a victim's uh, network. And then you have the ransomware group itself. That's the group that developed the ransomware. They may be the ones to deploy it in the environment, or they may sell that, uh, that onto another cyber criminal group as well. And also then finally you have the exfiltration and monetization of the data as well. So we're seeing an increase in that ransomware as a service model. Over the course of 2021, a number of those groups did shut down because of some high profile ransomware attacks, namely the Colonial Pipeline attack and JBS food that occurred. They gained a lot of notoriety because of those events, more than they intended and they shut down their activity as a result of increased political pressure and also increased law enforcement focus as well. But in general, we've seen the number of ransomware as a service groups increase over the course of 2021. And then we are seeing an increase in access brokers. So these are groups that are specifically dedicated to gaining access into a victim's environment where they will essentially gain the initial access and sell that access on to other groups. They have no intention of going further into the environment, getting detected and putting themselves at risk. So there's an increase in that environment. It's, uh, it's building to the diversification of that entire ecosystem as well. So the threats are becoming more and more varied and we've seen that over the course of last year and into the first half of this year as well. In terms of motivation for nation state actors, Primarily their motivation would be normally to get into a victim's organization for the purposes of intelligence collection. They want to get in, they want to get in covertly, uh, maintain persistence in that environment without being discovered 
and then identifying files of relevance to them and extracting that at a later date, ideally without being discovered. But now, with the emergence of this uh, new lock and leak tactic, where again they are using ransomware purely for destructive purposes, they will typically target organizations that are they perceive to be against their national country's aims or objectives. So that's an interesting development we saw. E-crime actors, for the most part, they're financially motivated. They will typically look for the path of least resistance. If they can get into an organization, if they can use access brokers who are already in that environment, they will do so. They will use known vulnerabilities. They will scan for these vulnerabilities, try and get in via that method as well. And finally, we're seeing a move away from uh, traditional methods of entry. So typically that would have been your phishing emails with malicious documents. We're now seeing a move to more fileless techniques, the use of leaked credentials, which would not necessarily trigger cybersecurity tools in that environment as well. If they can get in without being detected, it's easier for them and it's less risk to them as well. So those are the major trends we've seen overall in the ransomware space over the course of 2021.